are to police visibility and help effectively counter the activities of criminals who tend to get away on motorbikes. There will be all over and all the, we have about 32 police districts, 32 police districts within Accra. So we have Odoko having their own motorbike patrols. We have Dansoma having their motorbike patrols. So we make sure that we have covered everywhere. We, we, we tax all the districts within Accra to make sure that everybody operates motorbikes. And they are all doing so. And it's moving further. And that is also supporting the work of the vehicular patrols, the snap checks, and the visibility points to make sure that uh, we bring crime to the lowest level. Despite the measures, DCOP Yohonu said members of the public also have a duty to ensure their personal safety. To make sure you report any incident. If it happens to your neighbor, be the person to give direction to the police to the location. So you, the victim on the attack, immediately you sense danger. Just call your next neighbor on phone. Call the person and tell that my house is under attack. Period. You finish. Let because of that neighborhood relationship, he also knows that. Oh yes, I have to respond. So he will be doing all the communication to bring the police to the location. The public is also being encouraged to report any suspicious persons or activities in their communities. The Narcotics Control Board has begun interrogating five persons found on board a foreign vessel busted with 21 bags of substances suspected to be cocaine. The vessel, Atia Georgetown, was intercepted at Tekendi by the Western Region Naval Command. It was said to be Guyana-bound when it was stopped and escorted by naval officers on board the MV Asantua to the Tekendi Naval Base. The five persons, four Guyanese and one Ghanaian, were then handed over to the National Security and the Narcotics Control Board in Accra. The suspected cocaine is estimated to be worth $30 million. The vessel is believed to have been registered as a fishing trawler in Jamestown, a suburb of Accra. Chief Justice Georgina Fidorud is said to have instituted a probe into various allegations of judicial tampering in a recently decided election petition. A source close to the Judicial Council of Ghana said the decision to probe the allegations was taken at an emergency meeting on Wednesday, November 20. According to the source, the claim by dismissed Deputy Communications Minister Victoria Hammer that Gender and Social Protection Minister Nano Elitha may have played a role in securing a favorable verdict for President John Mahama and the other respondents in the election petition is one of three allegations to be investigated. The source further noted that previous allegation that the judiciary was interfered with in the matter of the election petition having to do with the involvement of the Tunfo over the Santé Henu Tunfo say to the second had been lumped together with Vicky Hammer's claims. Uh, Santihini denied the claim contained in an online newspaper publication, just as Nana Oyelitha did in a press release. Elsewhere, two unit classroom block under construction and funded by the Parents Teachers Association of St. Paul's Junior High School in Tamale has collapsed on two pupils. The two are currently in hospital receiving medical attention. The two pupils, Mutawuke Wunam and Fadilan Idrisu, were said to be playing in the classroom block during break time when the wall of the building fell on them, leaving the two with severe injuries on their bodies. It took the intervention of residents in the area who struggled to remove the debris off the victims and rushed them to the Tamale Teaching Hospital where they are receiving treatment. A concerned resident, Inusa Abdullahi, who spoke to Joy News, said the collapse of the building was expected because the material that was being used for the project was substandard. He said he had complained to school authorities about the poor work being done by the contractor on the project, but they always looked unconcerned. The building started when I was passing. So when the train started, it started in a, around... Around unexpected time, because the foundation was, they, they just dug the thing shallow. And the thing, the train itself is not, the depth is not up. 
but they just do the thing shortly without putting pillars. Headmaster of the school, Al Hassan Bukhari, however, said the construction of the classroom is under the supervision of the chairman of the school's PTA, and many appeals drawing his attention to the kind of substandard materials being used by the contractor after several complaints by residents fell on deaf ears. Complaints started. I used from time to time move around the building and look at it. Then, at a certain point, I realized that beyond the lintel. The building was not straight, so I drew the attention of the man who was doing the construction and told him this was the objection I had made. So what did he have to say about it? The PTA chairman, when contacted, declined to comment on the issue. Hashmin Mohammed's report. There have been calls for proper legislation on sanitation along with more punitive sanctions for people who fail to observe proper hygiene and litter the environment. According to community leaders drawn from some of Accra's worst affected suburbs, such a law will be one of the effective ways to tackle the chronic sanitation problem. The community leaders drawn from Malam, Nima, Ashaima, Mamobi and others met on World Toilet Day to brainstorm on ways to tackle poor sanitation and waste management, probably the biggest challenge facing the Accra metropolis. Although the Accra Metropolitan Assembly says it is doing all it can, it has been unable to comprehensively deal with the lack of toilets in many homes, for instance. Despite the existence of a bylaw making it obligatory for landlords to provide places of convenience. This has meant pressure on public toilets and others preferring to defecate at the beaches, in bushes, drains and uncompleted buildings. We can say that about 80% of the households don't have toilet facilities and it's very, very, very bad. So what do we see? We see people finding a polythene bag, doing it nicely in it and then maybe behind people's households mixed with the refuse and other ways in, in gutters and what have you. But the issue of public or opening the vacation, I think government have to come in for massive education. If we have such education in our community, it will go a very long way to save whatever facility. Don't wait for Zoom Lion, because they said Zoom Lion has mandated to clean our community Everybody is waiting for Zoom Line to come and do it. But those days, Zoom Line is not in the system. It is your duty. The community leaders who participated in the program were drawn from a Water Aid Ghana project which engages them to sensitize their members on proper hygiene and sanitation practices. Meanwhile, the Environmental Protection Agency is taking delivery of bins and self-educational stickers to be used for its yet-to-be-launched segregation project. The project aims to encourage the public to segregate their trash into different bins so it can be better managed as well as aid recycling efforts. The 5040 letter dustbins and 300 self educational stickers were donated by Jakura Ventures. The company's technical director, Emmanuel Nati Tukoli, explained the trash is to be segregated according to the color of the bin. As waste management professionals, we see the objective of the agency coinciding with our corporate plans to continue to offer quality and efficient services at an affordable cost to our valued clients. We are convinced that waste segregation at the source of generation is the way to go in order to guarantee the delivery of high quality raw material to industry, create job openings for the teeming youth, reduce pressure on the current system of waste disposal through landfilling, reduce the overall cost of delivering solid waste management services to our cherished clients, and create additional wealth within the sector. The brown dustbins represent paper waste, the blue dustbins represent plastic waste, and the green ones represent organic waste. Now we have more news coming up after the break. Don't go away. Commercial drivers are calling for an end to the bureaucracy associated with acquiring roadworthy certificates at the Driver Vehicle and Licensing Authority. 
This, they say, will go a long way to help eliminate corruption at the DVLA, as well as ensure the vehicles that ply our roads are in good condition. Yafusua Jemfi has been speaking to some drivers and passengers alike about road safety as we commemorate National Transport Day. The National Road Safety Commission estimates that 25% of all fatal road accidents are caused by rickety commercial vehicles and carelessness on the part of drivers. The lack of a comprehensive policy regulating public transportation has also been identified as a contributory factor for accidents on our roads since there appears to be no clear-cut rules on operating in the sector. Seats in commercial transport vehicles are usually worn out with little or no leg room for passengers. They are also usually stuffy, hot and unfriendly. As for seat belts, the least said about them, the better, because it is very rare to find these life-saving gadgets in public transport vehicles. DVLA, I believe that they have, they have to check a lot of things at the DVLA then to help us. They, they have opened a lot of venues. The procedure, the procedure. If you are frustrated, you have to find a Goro man to do the job for you. If the procedure is okay, there's no big deal. If you are, I, I went to their place, the procedure has to be easy. The bureaucratic system is too much. Because of that, I have to find somebody to take a shortcut. Shortcut will bring a problem. So but many Ghanaians are left with no choice but to patronize these vehicles and pray they arrive at the destination safely. As the country celebrates National Public Transport Day, drivers at some lorry terminals have called on government to reduce the procedure in acquiring roadworthy certificates in order to help tackle corruption in the system as well as reduce road accidents. Yeah, they have to work on it because as you can see this car, everything is like metal. Uh, if you're not careful, you'll be hurt. And I think... It's not helping. It's not helping. Most of the cars, too, there are no space. As you can see here, look at my knees. There are no spaces. So sometimes you find it difficult to sit in a car for a very long period. And I think they have to work on it. Uh, maybe the seats should take about three people. But then they will say it should take up four people. Then you'll be squeezed in the car. you don't feel comfortable. By the time you get home, then you are tired. You don't even have time to learn or, you know, do certain things. They also spoke about some measures they are putting in place to ensure an accident-free Christmas season. Starts every three, three months. We organize them. We give them how to drive on the road to assist patients. What I want to do to help road accident is early in the morning when you wake up, you have to check your tire pressure, check your crotch and everything before you start the engine. But passengers also have a role to play in ensuring safety on the roads. Now, yeah, now, yeah, passengers, and so told that you made to phone on drivers, no problems. If you crank car, we'll be see on can in term driver net chemono after you know better yet and on can miss you and no one you're not coffee problems. And they haven't to be a messenger and say, Yeah, passengers, you know, who said drivers in the meeting, one more professional, I say, they were seeing your board the other day. At the, mile almost. the National Road Safety Commission is meanwhile urging commercial vehicle owners to adopt the culture of maintenance. I would uh, urge all vehicle operators and owners of vehicles that as much as you would want money, that is, as the driver should go on various trips, try and invest in, in the maintenance of your vehicle. And I'm sure if you do that, give them the requisite, uh, I mean, the amount of money they need to do their roadworthiness and then to maintain the vehicle on a regular basis, you will have your uh, equipment still with you or your, your investment still with you. And I'm sure over the period, you will see that you have gained than have lost because you have maintained your vehicle and it will give you more sales as you go along. This year's National Public Transport Day is focused on improving driver attitude on the road. The Land Administration Project is developing a National Geographic Information Database to provide more accurate information on towns and localities in Ghana. The database will also supply population figures and other demographic data that will be typically useful for planning and other purposes. The National Project Coordinator of, on the occasion of Geographic Information Systems Day explained the database will eventually be accessible to the public on mobile phones and other devices.
The National Geographic Information Database, an initiative of the Land Administration Project, aims to develop a central information system to harmonize the multiple data platforms. National Project Coordinator Dr. Isaac Kakari explains the concept. We are engaged in developing certain or formulating certain policies, one of which is the severe mapping policy. It, it will mean that, uh, for instance, we would want to ensure that any time survey is happening in Ghana, it should be done in tandem or under the direction of the sphere mapping uh, division of the Lands Commission, for instance, so that things will be done properly. There's a lot of activities happening. People are collecting data so many times when it should have been collected once and then we can use many times. So this is a way of trying to start a framework within which we can, we can have a sphere mapping done. He explains how the database could prove useful to members of the public. So come is a product which would, would, would not give him problems because you take a site plan to Lands Commission and say this is not accurate. We can't accept that what we are doing will make it, it will stop those kind of things so that things will be done much more scientifically because the, the, the technology is there for us to do these things. The World Geographic Information System Day itself is organized by the Department of Geography and Resource Development at the University of Ghana, Lagon. Speaking on the theme, securing Ghana through the power of geographic information system. Minister of Communications, Dr. Edward Omanebuama, lauded the initiative and said his ministry is collaborating with three other ministries and other key stakeholders on the project. We are providing a robust ICT ecosystem together with the private sector. And this is because without a robust ICT ecosystem, it is almost impossible to take advantage of GIS. The formal launch of the construction of the 780 kilometer fiber optic ICT backbone infrastructure on the eastern corridor of the country was performed at Wamale near Tamale this year to provide broadband infrastructure to over 120 towns and communities along the route from Ho to Boko with link to Tamale from Yendi. The project is ongoing. Lecturer at the Department of Geography added the department is currently training some security agencies on emergency response data coding systems to make their work more efficient. Well, we're applying for a skill development fund to train emergency response agencies on the use of geospatial information technology in emergency response. And so we needed them also to say, yes, we want to receive the training and we want to use the technology. As a result, we we had a MOU signed which specifies that we are going to train them and we are also going to work with them in data collection and publishing of data for educating the public and also for them to use in their planning. The Department of Geography and Resource Development also commissioned a remote sensing geographic information system laboratory to help train students in geospatial technology. Parliament's Lands and Forestry Committee has been advocating for the Lands Commission to retain 40% of the revenue it generates. The money, according to the committee, will equip the Commission to sustainably administer the country's land resources. According to the chairman of the committee, Albert Abongo, the demand to build new structures to facilitate the land service delivery has overwhelmed the Lands Commission as a result of financial constraints and that the monies will make them more effective. We have granted the Lands Commission to retain 40% of monies received as levies, charges, or fees, in addition to 6% of revenue generated and collected from stamp duty assessments. Mr. Speaker, the proposal for the Commission to retain 40% of internally generated funds from fees and charges, as well as 6% of stamp duty revenue will ensure that the Commission is financially equipped to sustainably deliver effective land administration services in the country. The Deputy Ranking Member on the Committee, Benito Usubio, supported the move and urged Parliament to make a recommendation to the Executive. Mr. Speaker, I pray that this particular statement does not end up becoming just like one of the other statements that are always made in this House. But rather this House take a critical look and even the house comes up with a good recommendation. MP for second D, Papa Usu Ankuma, suggested the committee files a motion for the house to work on it. If this had come in the form of a motion, it may have helped. 
because when you bring a motion and the house takes a decision on it, it becomes something which the executive must comply with. The Minister for Lands and Natural Resources, Ahaji Inusa Fuseni, seconded the call and hoped the House could reach a consensus on the matter. We are asking that we build consensus to allow the Lands Commission to retain some money. And I agree entirely with you that one could come by way of motion. But Mr. Speaker, the exercise this morning is to enable us to build consensus on the way forward. MP for Hafono Southeast, a member of the committee, explained how this could resolve the problem of land guards. Most of the land guards, where they operate, is along the boundary of two chiefs. That's where the land guards are. So we, if we get survey department resource, say that they can demarcate two land boundaries, boundary between chiefs, boundary between paramounts, boundary between Odikros, we get all this surveyed. My brother, like it to be so easy for us to manage lands in the country. But these things are not there. Sitting resumes on Thursday. Now, to probably discourage any suggestions that they follow President Mohammed's queue and voluntarily cut their salaries, some MPs have downplayed the initiative. The MPs who have been expressing their views on the executive's 10% pay cut were worried they could rather encourage corruption. The president, according to the finance minister during the presentation of the 2014 budget, has directed that the executive pay cut, estimated to be around 80000 be channeled into maternal care. But the MP for Futu believes the labor law frowns upon it. They have decided, and I'm rather saying that it gives room for corruption. Okay, they have decided they want to cut their pay for whatever reason given in the budget, which we think that it is inconsistent with, you know, uh, labor, you know, uh, policy on remuneration. But it's a political decision. We'll leave it at that. There were others who were of the opinion similar pay cuts in the past, though symbolic, did not yield much. They are admitting to the fact that there's wastage in the system. That's the way I see it. And that boys are brave. It's really true that boys are brave. But this is not the first time that's happened in this country. Nkoma did it. It didn't change the country. Buzia did it. It didn't change the country. Uh, and they are doing it. Others also explained the move will be an excuse for officials to pursue other illegitimate means to make money, especially because they are amongst the least paid amongst their colleagues in the sub-region. Already, if you, if you take our salaries as members of parliament or members of the executive you know, along the West African coast, I th we may rank among the lowest paid, you see. So... If, if somebody hears it outside, the person will say, oh, what is this? Let us manage the economy in such a way that if even you are doubling the salaries of the executive and the legislature and the judiciary, nobody will, will, will make any comment on it. But in this era where taxes, taxes and taxes upon taxes have eaten away every single persuader that anybody gets, and you say you are going to cut that thing, forgetting that most of these people have a lot of responsibilities. Even that amount is no, so insignificant. It doesn't cover anything. You are pushing them to become corrupt. Not all of them agreed, though. How can that breed corruption? How on earth? I quite remember, even in the U.S., you go to the history, there was a time the executives were not even taking their salary. I, I don't remember. Go to other jurisdictions. They have done it. When there's authority or the executive found that the economic situation has a little problem, they take a bold decision. It has happened. This is not the first time in the world that's happened. And how does it bring corruption? How does this lead to corruption? They are talking about their salaries. We have not yet defined the salary, but I can assume that it is their gross salary. It doesn't include the allowances. So if you see an executive take, let's say, 7,000 Ghana cities, and they are taking 10% of that every month, what is wrong with that? I mean, something we should encourage to go on. How can this breed corruption? Tell me before God the man, how does it lead to corruption? Or are people saying that because they cut their temper, they must find a means somewhere to uh, balance it? Oh, come on. I mean, we are being challenged to think that way. I think we need to give some credit where it is due. All right, now that sounds like an MP who's willing to take a pay cut. But up next, we bring you Business News with Abigail Adumako. Thank you.
So I'm here to bring you the latest in business. I'm Abigail Adumakwenchi. Now, Deputy Minister for Finance, Kweku Ricketts Hagen, has debunked arguments the 2014 budget does not clearly address the unemployment challenge in the country. He explains the infrastructure development plan in the budget will ensure permanent and decent jobs for the youth. The Deputy Finance Minister was speaking to Joy Business on the commemoration of African Statistics Day in Accra, where statistics from the 2010 population and housing census indicated 12.9% of persons aged between 15 and 24 were unemployed. 67% of the population was also found employable. It, however, put the unemployment rate at a curious low of 6%. Economist Dr. Eric Osei Estibe explains. People are not well paid. Many are exploited. They work more than they're supposed to work. Many are underemployed. And so, although they are working, they can be described as working poor. They are not actually getting what they're supposed to get to make life worthwhile. And so, uh, to me, uh, we are losing on that side, not creating enough employment, decent employment for our team in youth. And so I believe that policy should begin to target. They, they shouldn't just look at the data, you know, because the data can be very misleading. He argues the 2014 budget did not clearly tackle the challenge of youth unemployment as expected. But Deputy Finance Minister Kweku Rikit Hagen disagreed. Usually when you create this kind of, you know, youth employment and all these things that we have done in the past, you know, the GDES and other things, that you, you have seen the results. You see, job creation is not necessarily just about creating something and call it, you know, you are using it to create jobs. If you build a good economy, the economy itself will create jobs. If you do infrastructure development or if you spend a lot of your resources in doing infrastructure development, there is a lot of jobs that are created at the back of infrastructure development. So you may not have specific policy of job creation or job generation, but it is usually embedded in a lot of projects that, that, that you come up with. Meanwhile, the statistical service has launched five monographs prepared from the 2010 population and housing census to mark the African Statistics Day, which emphasizes the need for quality data to support the progress of the continent. We'll definitely be bringing you more on the budget. But away from the budget, Multi TV's flagship housing fair, Habitat Fair, is set to come off this weekend in the Ashanti regional capital, Kumasi. The fair, which comes off at the Golden Tulip Hotel, aims to attract potential homeowners, individuals interested in improving their current home, as well as those who would like to take equities on their properties. Mohammed Nuruddin previews the fair. <music> After a successful hosting of the multi-TV Habitat Fair in Accra, organizers are taking it to the Garden City. The Kumasi edition will have exhibitors in the housing industry from the public and private sectors. Real estate developers, real estate contractors, building contractors, estate agents, architectural firms, property management, furniture companies, electric appliance companies, the banking industry and uh, office and home security are all involved in a habitat fair. It's not just the housing industry, but uh, everything that also goes into the housing industry. The exhibition will cover a broad range of products and services, comprising works related to both interior and exterior decor. Participants would have the platform to sell directly to 10,000 potential clients, opportunity to interact with target markets, get immediate feedback on their product range, among others. After our last edition in Accra, we set the ball rolling for the commercial market. We put all the logistics together. We got all the media houses involved. That's the multimedia houses involved. And uh, we've done considerable advertising on all our platforms. We have spoken to lots of the uh, potential clients and uh, I can say that we have quite a satisfactory number uh, of, of participants this year. 
The Habitat Fair begins on Friday, November 22nd and ends on Sunday, November 24th, 2013. Well, the ECOWAS Community Court of Justice has dismissed a case brought against Ghana by some Nigerian traders doing business in the country. The court rejected the arguments of the traders that sections of the new Ghana Investment Promotion Council GIPC Act, which bar foreigners from engaging in retail trade in a country's markets, were in violation of the ECOWAS protocol on free movement of people and goods. It upheld submissions filed by the Attorney General Marietta Brewer Pierre Pong and argued uh, by Deputy AG Dr. Dom Dominic Aini and Chief State Attorney Dorothy Efriansa. They, among other things, argued that the law was necessary to protect Ghanaians or uh, the Ghana's domestic interests and could not have been said to violate the COAS protocol on free movement of people and goods. The Nigerian traders, led by the National Association of Nigerian Traders and the Nigerian Union of Traders Association, Ghana, uh, Ghana petitioned the ECOWAS Community Court of Justice over the new GIPC Act, which was revised in July this year, and among other things, specified the criteria foreigners would have to meet in order to be able to do business in the country. And on that note, I'll end the business, uh, joy business here, and the news continues shortly. Joy News Business was brought to you in association. Right, let's chase news the world is talking about in the world of sports. And President John Dramani Mahama wants Ghana to make a major impact or impact at Brazil 2014. The president hosted the leadership of the Ghana FA, the sports ministry, the technical team at a cocktail to congratulate the team a few hours ago for ensuring a smooth qualification at the expense of the highly rated Egypt. Joy Sports cameras were present and caught up with the key actors. Ghana has become a permanent fixture in the World Cup considering that for three successive World Cups we have been present. And so once again, Brazil 2014, Ghana for the third time consecutively is going to be represented. On behalf of the government and the nation, I want to first of all thank the minister and his staff for the human's job that they have carried out. Um, for providing the kind of leadership that has been necessary for the FA and the other constituent groups to be able to perform. I also want on behalf of the nation to thank the Football Association for the good job you've done. And um, we don't want to always uh, say that we did well, we almost got there. I mean, this time we have to try and get there. And so let's all do what we can to ensure that um, this time we are able to bring the cup you know, back home to Ghana. That would be the greatest, greatest gift you ever give the people of Ghana. And I want to, I know Ghanaians like their football and are very passionate, but I want to advise all our supporters and our team in sympathizers that we need to have patience, you know, for these players. Now, the 2013 Go TV Waffle Cup is set to kick off tomorrow in Kumase after five of the participating member associations arrived in the Ashanti regional capital this afternoon. The final two, Niger and Liberia, though, are expected to arrive tomorrow. Very sorry for the loss of sound there. We'll quickly move on to the Black Queens there. The senior national team, female team, of course, the Black Queens, have begun preparation for next year's Africa Women's Championship. The latest from their camp is a call-up of 31 players for the continental assignment. 31 players have been selected into the Black Queens team to begin preparations towards the 2014 Africa Women's Championship qualifiers. The players selected into the senior women's national team are to report at the Ghanaman Soccer Center of Excellence on Friday, 22nd November. 2013. Ghana began the African qualifiers against Burkina Faso. The Black Wings will travel to Ouagadougou for the first leg qualifier for the first round. The first leg matches will be between 13 to 15 February 2014, with the return games fixed for 28 February to 2nd March 2014.
We're all looking up to what will happen at the Elwak Stadium shortly as season seven of the Joy Sports Invitational Tournament. At this time, we turn our attention to find out how Ghana Commercial Bank are getting ready for this. training has been very very vigorous we have had some of them flying out and coming back and as we're speaking right now our managing director is still in uh, uh, what do you call it UK he's making some few meetings with us in Wenga to come back with new strategies for the men to be able to take the cup we just need the two trophies for the men and the ladies soccer and each person is taking ten thousand dollars home free the ladies team is not coming down and we are telling our opponents that as we prepare strongly they should also be ready for us because we are much more ready for them uh, more than they think and this time we are bringing the cup to GCB GCB when you look at some of our players like we have 30 men we have ACN we have Richard Wine and all kind of players that we have over there they are not coming from anywhere but they are coming from straight from GCB actually yes, sir. Yeah, I mean, we are not going to create any room for complacency no, no, we are going all out to win our games all that we want to tell them that no team no team will beat us and we are assuring the competition we are not going to win any match through penalties we will win our matches within regulation time that is what we need to be our team all right, so it's easy. Keep on talking. We'll find out what happens on the day, really. My name is George Adegina. That'll be all for sports tonight. It's always coming back with Israel with some international news. Sports was brought to you in a... After publicly declaring his intent to join the music group VIP, the hip life grandpapa, Reggie Rockstone, has finally been confirmed as the newest member of the group. This goes to confirm that Promzy is truly no longer a member of the Boogie Down Nima group. To understand that these brothers made something out of my dream, something that I started, this hip life. So um, I qualify for the job. I mean, if, if, if they got a vacancy, why not? I, I can't really replace Promzy, of course. You know, Promzy's, you know, but um, God knows I could do well. We about to make some money. Employ me, bring you some money <laughs> everybody got dreams that's one of mine well, i want to be a part of vip and why not they're, they're very close friends of mine and they're like family and you know i have been privileged to see uh the progression of, of their career you know i we were prodigal lazy bone friction uh, uh, Promzy, all of these young brothers, very talented. You got to also understand that these brothers made something. Out. Many had said Reggie Rockstone's public declaration to join VIP was just a publicity stunt. But weeks after he made the comment, the two remaining members of VIP, that is Lazy or Seal and Prodigal, have agreed to bring the grandpapa on board. Reggie Rockstone confirmed to MyJoyOnline.com on Tuesday that he is officially now a member of VIP, a group he has always wanted to be a part of. Always wanted to be in, in, in the group, VIP. You know what I mean? I, I always, they used to laugh at me. You know, you understand, I, I, I watch these brothers grow, you know, from when they was teenagers. You know? Manager of VIP Bulldog has also confirmed Reggie is the newest member of the group. Well, we wait to see what Reggie, who, by the way, says he's on retirement, will bring on board the VIP train. No. Ah. Woke up early this morning, crack a dawn. All right, I guess it makes it uh, Promzy, Lazy, and Grandpapa. But I can't wait to hear what, uh, what else uh, Reggie Rockstone has to, to add to the group. But it'll be pretty interesting. That's it for Showbiz.
All right, so um, my director just drew my attention to the fact that I got their names mixed up. It's actually supposed to be uh, Prodigal, Lazy, and Grandpapa. That's a new VIP. That's it for the bulletin. Before we go, we quick run through our top stories. Accra Region Police Commander following the arrest of a notorious armed robber raises concern. An increasing number of ex-convicts are returning to a life of crime after prison. The police, meanwhile, says officers on leave are being recalled to beef up their visibility in town to ensure crime is reduced to the barest minimum this Christmas. NACOB interrogates five suspects in connection with high seas drug bust estimated to be worth $30 million. On the occasion of National Transport Day, commercial drivers have called for an end to the bureaucracy at the Driver Vehicle Licensing Authority to help eliminate corruption there. And Parliament Lands and Forestry Committee makes a case for the Lands Commission to be allowed to retain 40% of its internally generated funds. That's it from all news. Log on to myjoyonline.com. My name is Israel Lyons.